here we are. We have done now 17 of these episodes. Mel uh, has done an amazing job taking what uh, AJ Deuce has put together and has formulated and brought it down to layman's terminology so that I can understand it and so also that you can understand it. But you, we are getting an awful lot of responses from people who are saying, hold on, hold on, hold on, just too much, way too much material. And that's understandable. We have been introducing so much for, with every episode, trying to find out what this Muhammad is or who this Muhammad is. Because obviously, the, the elephant in the room is this. As we have been saying, the Muhammad of Islam never existed in the 7th century. And we've said that. We have our Robert Spencer, who has written a book. Did Muhammad exist in 2012? It went viral and a huge backlash. He's now redone that book in 2021 to add just even more material to support that there just is no prophet named Muhammad from the Hijaz, from that central area of Arabia, Mecca and Medina. And so if he is not that far south, then where did this Muhammad come from? If he is not there in Arabia, then where is he? And obviously the answer the Muslims have been saying is he's all over the place. He's everywhere. Of course he existed. And of course people are coming up with reference after reference after reference. Muhammad here, or Muhammad there, or Muhammad over here. He's fighting a battle up there in northern Israel. He's over here in Gaza. He's coming from Hira in Iraq. He's up there in Damascus. He is everywhere but where he should be. He's everywhere but where he should be. And no one's paying attention to look at a map. You've got to place him on a map. And you've got to realize that all these seventh century references prove that this word Muhammad, and it's just really four letters because we don't have the vowels here. It's just M H M D, Muhammad. This is a title, not a person, though it's a title of people, applied to people. Let me repeat that. This is a title. Mel, back me up on this. Is this true? It is. It is absolutely. Um, it only became a, a, a name much later, centuries much later. later. Once, once we and have a prophet of, the, of Arabia in the mythology, then it becomes a name. So hold on, hold on, hold on. What am I talking about? What am I, what is Mel, what are Mel and I talking about? <laughs> Here's what I mean. I until this I we made this video and until I started reviewing, I realized the problem. We're just not explaining ourselves well. See, here's the difficulty. It, when we look at the manuscripts, the, the the Arabic manuscripts of the Quran, uh, the earliest manuscripts, uh, the Topkapi, uh, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Petropolitanas, the Husseini, the Sana manuscript, all these great manuscripts, three of them, which I have right here in my studio, in my office, we've always known that there were no vowels in the seventh century, not in Arabic. Dots were just beginning to be introduced, but they were not canonized. That comes much later in the 8th and the ninth century. And vowels, the same thing. There were no dots or vowels, in fact, in the 7th century, not in the earliest manuscripts, and not in Arabic. So when we say the word Muhammad, what do you notice? I'm including three vowels, aren't I? A dama after the mim, ha, a fata after the ha. And then another fata after the next mim, followed by the dal. See, Muhammad requires three vowels. And so we're looking for Muhammad. And that's what everybody's been looking for because the Muslims have told us and all the traditions tell us. And, and you and I know that it is the Muhammad that was born in 570. It was the Muhammad uh, that lived in Mecca uh, from 570 and 610. He started receiving those revelations in the Hira cave. And then he died in 632. That is Muhammad. Muhammad. And so everybody has known that he lived there and then he moved to Medina in 622. And when he died, the, the Quran that he had been receiving was then written down. And this Muhammad that we're all looking for is a name of a person, a man. But so therefore we scoured all the different documents from that time. We've all looked at everything that we could. Let me just get this book. In fact, the book that we all go to is Seeing Islam as Others Saw It. This is the classic book that was first printed in uh, 
1997 or 1999 uh, in the last century by, by our good friend Robert Hoylet, Dr. Robert Hoylet. And of course, he reads and writes 18 languages, and he was taking everything that was written about this prophet, Muhammad. Uh, I'm just going to open up here randomly. Let's just, oh, this he's talking about Sabaeus here, and he is referring to this Muhammad. Now, he's writing in the mid 7th century, and he says about this, Muhammad preached, saying. So there's the word. So you see it right there? There is the name, Muhammad. So he writes it, Muhammad. What he's not telling you, and this is a, one of the biggest problems I have with Robert Hoyland, is he's writing it with vowels. There are no vowels in the 7th century. So how could he know that was Muhammad? No one's bothered to ask him that. Here's his newest book, and he hasn't changed it. In fact, all the way through, he puts Muhammad, 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 and he even interjects it there. And this is why we're looking and we're asking, we, we've all made a cardinal error. See, there were no vowels that early, so how do we know it was referred to as Muhammad? Let me just give you an example of that. I've got two of the six major manuscripts. I've got a, a, third, a top copy back up there, but I'm just going to show you with these here. Uh, here is the Petropolitan. So I'm just going to open up to any random page. These are so heavy. And I want you to look here and notice that there are no dots or no vowels there. You notice that there? Can you see that? No dots and no vowels. This is the pick. This is a facsimile of the original. That's why it's so big. It's the original of the original text. This is an eighth century text. Some would say between seven twenty to seven fifty. So let's just say mid eighth century. There are no vowels. Do you see any damas, any fatas, or any kasa? Fatas would be the ah uh sound. Damas would be the u, and kasa would be the e. None, none of the three vowels there, and there are no dots as well. You need the five dots to make the five letters that are needed. Then. Here is another one. This is the Mutil manuscript. This is the one in the British Library. Let's just open up to any page. And you can see, if you open up to any page, no dots, no vowels, slanted text. You can see there are 16 consonants. Only 16. Today, there are 28, but not here. Not in this page or any other page. All of them, they all have no dots and no vowels. There you can see, no dots and no vowels. No dots and no vowels. So this is something we've known about the manuscript, and we've said this over and over again. They don't really become standardized until, oh, about the 8th, some uh, standardized, probably not till the ninth century. So if they are not there until the 8th or ninth century, then they cannot be there in the 7th century. So any reference to whatever this person that they're referring to, any reference to whatever this person is, it would not be Muhammad. Take the three vowels out, and you're left with four consonants. Mimha, Mimdal. Mimha, Mimdal. That's it. Those four consonants. What, how do you pronounce those four consonants? Well, take out the vowels. You can pronounce them anytime you want. But almost everybody, when you see those four consonant letters, it's Mahmud. Mahmud. Or Mah. You can say Muhammad if you want to, but you can't write it that way, you see? You can't write it that way. So we've been looking for Muhammad with the Dhamma, Fata, and Fata, and we've been thinking through that. You should be doing that. No. And so neither should Robert Hoyland. He shouldn't have been doing that. Just take the three vowels out and let's bring it back to the four consonants. Now with those four consonants, now let's continue with the video. You'll understand then what I'm talking about. So what Mel and I are going to do now, we're going to put it all together. Because we, we, we hear you. Listen, we hear you. You are saying this is just too much material. It's going all over the place. It, it really isn't going all over the place, but we can understand after 17 episodes, you're wondering, how does it make sense? How are we going to use it? How can we understand it? So, so we're going to start to put it all together, make sense of it so that you can understand. But what's the purpose of Mel and I spending all this time if you're not going to use it and actually apply it with your own uh, friends, with your Muslims that you come across, and when this discussion comes up, as it will. Because without Muhammad, Islam doesn't exist. They have to have Muhammad. They have to have their Muhammad from the Hijaz, their Muhammad living in Mecca and Medina, their Muhammad receiving the Quran, their Muhammad living from seven, uh, 570 up to 632. 
and receiving this Quran from 610 to 632, if that Muhammad doesn't exist, if that Muhammad didn't receive a Quran that was in Arabic uh, in that 22-year period, then Islam does not exist. And this is why this is at the very foundation, the very root of what Islam is and what Muslims have to believe. So we are tackling something that most Muslims don't want to us uh, to attack. But this is what you do with historical criticism. Historical criticism, by its very definition, demands of the historian that they go back to the time period that the historical claims are made. We are not making the historical claims. Islam has made that historical claim. And Islam, the standard Islamic narrative that we have been talking about for years, claims three things that there was a man named Muhammad who was born in 570, died in 632, received a Quran in a place called Mecca, a place called Mecca between 610 and 622, and that which he received was the Quran. That was the Quran in that 22-year period. Those are three historical claims that every Muslim believes, and every one of you have believed until we started putting some wrenches into this, and that this all happened in the 7th century, 610, to 632, that period, that 22-year period, in Mecca, in Medina, by a man named Muhammad uh, called, and the book that he was given is the Quran. So we're going to tackle all three of those, but right now we're attacking or confronting or trying to ask questions of, or critiquing is probably the better word, we're critiquing the name Muhammad, because this is the guy that received the book in the place called Mecca. If this is the guy that received the book, then how can you or us, or any of us, know that this book was at that place with that man between the year 610 and 632. So let's do dive into it, and let's try to make sense of it, and let's try to come up with some type of conclusions so that you can use it. Back to you, Mel. Mel, this is the question I'm going to ask you, and I want you to just kind of give an overview now of this name, Muhammad, because Muhammad, listen, the name is important. My name is Jay, but I'm not the only Jay. There are many Jays. Your name is Mel. You're not the only Mel. There are hundreds, thousands of Mel's all over the world, and you're all living here in the 21st century. But to, in order to stipulate that I am the J that lives here in Pennsylvania, and you are the Mel that lives there in Europe, that people have to come to some conclusion that they've got the right J and the right Mel living at the right place. That's all we're asking. We did this with Jesus Christ, did we not? When the questions came out with Hel Wellhausen back in the, uh, the 1800s, he, 19th century, he asked this very question, can you prove that there was a person named Jesus who died on the cross and rose again in a place called Jerusalem? That's all he was asking, the book, The Man, The Place. That was asked in the 1800s, and we had to come up with that type of proof. And what did we use? We used evidence from the first century, not from the third, fourth, and fifth century redacted back onto the first century. We use evidence from the first century to prove that Jesus existed and that he died on the cross. We had to do that. And we had to use all kinds of historians from that time period. We had to use Tacitus, the Roman historian. We had to use Josephus, the Jewish historian. We had to use Thallus and Phlegon, the Greek uh, satirists who were debating the event of his death there in 52 AD. So we had to go to the first century and find evidence for the first century for this man and for Jerusalem and for that event. If we have been able to do that in the last hundred years, then Islam, we demand that Islam do the same thing. And we're not talking about the first century now. We're talking about the seventh century. This is 600 years later. This is much more recent. This is only 1400 years ago. So Muslims, you've got to prove to us, give us evidence that there is a man named Muhammad, a man, not a title, not a reference, not a, a uh, a, a caliphon that you put onto a, a, a category. It has to be a person, a man, that lived between 570 and 632 and started receiving this book in 610 there in those two cities. And that's why we want to ask you again, Muslims, show us the evidence for this man. We're going to show you that there's all kinds of evidence for this name, not for this man, but for this name, which is not a name. It has nothing to do with the name. But we're going to go start with the 7th century. But, well, this is where I'm going to bring you in now. Take over. You're not just going to start with the seventh century. You're going to show us that there's a whole history to this word, and it is not a name. So, what is it? Over to you. Yeah. So it's it's a title. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Kerr made a very interesting observation about the name Muhammad. If you look at the other variations of the name Mahmud, Mahmud, etc., and you'll see ver ver variations of that name all over the Middle East, you can't actually guess those names from Muhammad. 
it means that there was another similar sounding name which all of these names came from so you have to actually go back now if you go all the way back to eucharistic which is 14 centuries bc you actually find in eucharistic a word which is machmed which means the desirable one or the precious so it could be used in the context of gold because gold is precious you would want it you would desire it um, and then the jews who who live uh close to syria you, uh, the city of ugarit is is in syria ne right next to israel they pick up on that word they like it it's incorporated into hebrew and so you have the word machmed um and we see two different versions of it in the old testament we see we see um, mohammedim which is used in the song of songs um, and it's, it's referring to the lovely, the lovely one. Um, but what is, what's interesting, it's used as a messianic title. And that's how the Jews see it. A similar word is Hamad, which is also found in the Old Testament. So um, that term was even used further on, in, even into the Christian era, as a reference to Jesus. So the way Song of Songs is interpreted is that Jesus is talking to the church, the church is responding back and the church is referring to Jesus as the Macadim, or the, the lovely, the, the precious one, etc., the praised one. That's the sense, it has a messianic meaning to it. Okay, um, just stop to... that real quickly. We're talking about Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16. Yeah. And I think it'd be good, let me just read it here, since we do, we're, let's just read it so people know what we're talking about. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my lover. This is my friend. O daughters of Jerusalem. Altogether lovely is Mahmud in Hebrew. There is the Mahmud. Am, Ash, M, De. And what's fascinating, in Hebrew, nobody suggests that this is a person named Mahmud. This is a title of the altogether lovely referring to Solomon, but also a messianic title that is taken as a messianic Seven, title. There are 11 places in the Old Testament that use this word, Mahmed, Mahmed, yeah. over and over again. And in many cases, we could go through each one of them, but I think this is the most popular because isn't this interesting? Muslims have always claimed that this is a reference to Muhammad. They're Muhammad. They don't know that they're half correct. They are half correct. And yeah. This this is a reference to the altogether lovely one, but it is not their Muhammad at all. It is the altogether lovely one, which we're going to find out is a messianic title that has to do not with their Muhammad, but someone completely different. So back to you again. We're about a thousand BD. I just want to do one more thing. You said you said that the Muhammad could be uh, Muhammadin is the one for five sixteen. Yes. Um. Yeah. So it's. It's a poetic plural um, uh, that that is used that just essentially as you've described it, it means the altogether lovely. So that's that's essentially that that word. It's a messianic title, as we said. The Old Testament really is looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. That's you know, if you were to say in one line, what's the Old Testament all about? It's the coming of the Messiah. What's right. the New Testament all about? He has arrived. This okay. is the good news. That's right. it in a nutshell. And we do this at the, in, in theology. I remember when we were doing in seminary, it was always everything you look at these prophecies, these are the here, but not yet. Here, but not yet. You always, there's a two categories whenever you look at these prophecies. So that's that's Song of Solomon 516. But you have another one. You talk about Hamad or Hamid. And where is that found? Because that's another form of Mahmud. It's the, it's the diminutive form of Hamad. Where do you find that in the Old Testament? Okay, so I'll just... I'll just share it here with you. Let's see if we can have a look. So one of the places that you find it is in Psalm 68, 60, which God has desired for his abode. So it's the, the meaning of desired or has desire. Uh, you have Proverbs 12, 12, the wicked man desires the booty. Um, so the, the key meaning there is desired. And if you look at the variations on the word in Hebrew, um, you can see actually Mahmed is one of them, something desirable. Now that's actually the the form that became common in the seventh century to refer to the Messiah. That's really the essential one. So something desirable, um, and you can see all the other variations: Hamad, desired, coveted, 
uh, Hamoud, cute, lovely, sweet, pretty, etc. You have all the different variations. Um, if you look at the Arabic, you'll see similar uh, words. So Hamid, praise, Mahmed, desire, desirable thing, Mahmoud, desirable, precious thing. So it's all related. So there's obviously a, a strong similarity between Hebrew and Arabic, which lends itself to these words um, being borrowed into Arabic. Um, so it is clearly uh, a messianic word that you find in the Old Testament. And uh, it's a title, essentially. Uh, a very key uh, finding is we have an inscription way down in Yemen in the year 523 AD. Um, and there we have a Jewish inscription that basically refers to Mahmed on the inscription. Um, now, why is that significant? Because three years before that, we have the exilarch Marzutra who gets killed by the Persians. Of course, alarm bells go off in the Jewish community because if a Jewish exilarch gets killed, that for them is the Messiah being killed, the Messiah being Joseph. Um, and so the fact that there's an inscription three years later to commemorate his death in uh, 520 is significant. So that's 100 years prior to the story of Muhammad, um, which suggests that this movement is a Jewish one. It's, 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 it's following its way into the seventh century. Good. So we have we have Muhammad in the Old Testament, and we even have that in Ugaritic or the Ugarites, uh, who are re introducing this really in 1400 BC, picked up by the Hebrews in about 1000 BC, and is there in the Song of Solomon, it's there in the Psalms, it's there in the Proverbs, it's there very clear, the Muhammad, and we can see it 11 times in the Old Testament, and it's always referring to the desirable one, the desired one. So it seems then that now that the Jews know who this is, and they're, the word they're using in Hebrew uh, is this Mahmud. What about the Christians? Don't the Christians also have something to do with this? Yeah, so in the 4th century, you have people like St. Ambrose interpreting the Song of Songs, where it refers to the Mahmudim as referring to Jesus, the altogether lovely. So the Christians are saying, that Messiah that's been referred to in the Old Testament, we have him. It's Jesus. The Jews obviously have rejected that idea. They are continuing with their expectation that the Messiah is going to come along. Um, and so you have two communities, the Jews and the Christians, both aware of this concept of Mahmed being a mess messianic title. And this leads us all the way into the 7th century. So we get to the early 7th century and you have the exilarch Nehemiah bin Huziel who conquers Jerusalem in 614. Unfortunately, he gets killed in 617, and immediately the, the Jews respond by considering him to be the Messiah ben Joseph. Now, who is the Messiah ben Joseph? Well, this is a figure that's in Jewish theology, which is a Messiah who is the suffering one, like the, as we find in the Old Testament. And his purpose is to die on behalf of Israel, to make atonement to God through his suffering. But then the expectation would be that there would be another Messiah who is the Messiah bin David. And he would come later and he would be the conquering king. He would be the one that would defeat um, Israel's enemies. So that's what's going on in the early 7th century. So the Jews are basically saying, we've got the Mahmed. We've got the Mahmed bin Joseph. We've got the Mahmed bin David. So... We get into the 660s then, and then all of a sudden you have these coins appearing under Muawiyah. And they have Mahmud on it, but they're not claiming that Nehemiah is the Mahmud or even his brother Salman. They're basically putting crosses all over them. It's really clear who they think is the Mahmud. They think Jesus is the Mahmud. So you can see there's a debate across um, the cultural divides, you know, between the Christians and the Jews. It's, it's you know... The Christians are saying there is only one Messiah, not two, not three or four. There's no chain of Messiahs. It's only one. We've got him and he died on the cross and he resurrected. That's who the Messiah is. The Jews are saying, no, no, no. Um, it's our exilarch. He, he is the Mahmed. Um, and the, the Jews actually write in the 630s the story of Nehemiah dying and they actually identify him as Mahmed or as 
but they use the word Messiah there in that context. So it's clear what's going on. What we don't see is a, a, a Muhammad of Mecca showing his face in, in those records. We, we see a clear dialogue between two communities, but where are they? They're not down in the Hejaz, the way up north again. They're in Israel, they're in Syria, they're in Iraq. They're having this transnational debate about the Messiah. Everyone's talking about it. They didn't have TV back in those days, so if someone claimed to be the Messiah, it was a big deal, and everyone had a an angle on it and an opinion on it. So I think that's what was going on. I think it now makes not an awful lot more sense. A key figure in all of that, of course, in the 660s is Muawiyah, who the standard Islamic narrative has been telling us for years that he's a, a Muslim. But when we look at um, the chronicles about him, we look at the inscriptions, we don't seem to get the impression that he is a Muslim because, for example, on his inscriptions, there's a cross at the beginning of it. We also see what he does when he goes to Jerusalem. He goes to Golgotha. He goes to where uh, Jesus' mother uh, was buried. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He does all the things that you'd expect a Christian to do. Um, and um, I think that is a massive elephant in the room that Muslims need to face up to. The story doesn't line up with what we know about what happened in the seventh century. We don't see the, the Muhammad from from uh, the Hijaz. What we see is we see um, various messiahs, Jewish messiahs, who are um, being presented to the whole community as the, the saviors um, for the Jews at that time. And you have the Christians basically saying, no, we disagree. Uh, the, the Messiah can only be Jesus. So that's what I see is what's going on. Terrific stuff. All right. So you put everything into a nutshell and you've done a great job, Mel. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you have done. I hope you're all following this. This is what we've asked. We've always asked. It's just like a broken record. I keep reminding people. We're not arguing from silence, folks. It's the Muslims who are stipulating that the standard Islamic narrative says this man named Muhammad, born in 570, started receiving in a revelation in 610, uh, died in 632. The revelation was complete by the time he died, and he lived in Mecca and Medina, and what is today the Hijaz, that this is historical. They are saying this is historical. Now, in order for us to believe them, in order for you to believe them, the Muslims are going to have to come up with evidence to support those claims. All we're asking the Muslims to do is, okay, this Muhammad that you talk about, this name Muhammad, uh, that lived in 570 to 632, where is he in that place with that book? That's all we're asking. And so far, Muslims haven't been able to come up with anything. Everything they keep on throwing at us, whenever we ask them to support it, they always go back to the standard Islamic narrative. They're always going back to the 9th and 10th and 11th century. As we're soon going to find out, these aren't all, even 9th, 10th, and 11th. They're 12th to the 18th century. They're always going back to much, much later material that is redacting it back to this time period, the 7th century. A.J. Dios and you have decided, well, let's just see who this character is. This must be someone. And we're finding it's not just someone. It's someone's plural. It is actually a number of people. It's a number of categories of individuals who are the desirable one, the altogether lovely one, the precious one, uh, the praised one who at the very beginning, if, uh, during the Ugaritic period, it was the desirable or the precious one. That's how they were the ones that created this title, 1400 BC. That's about the time of Moses, isn't it? Uh, that was then picked up in Hebrew, and the Hebrews then expanded upon it. And around 1000 uh, AD, you see it appearing in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, as referring to Solomon, Solomon himself as the altogether lovely. Also, there's a messianic prophecy of who this altogether lovely one is. Much of the Old Testament, as you said so well, Mel, that much of when we read the Old Testament, we always have to read, it's pointing ahead, it's pointing to the future, that when the Messiah would come, when the Messiah would come. And who is this Messiah? He is the altogether lovely one. He is the praised one. He is the precious one. Now, this word is found in other parts. You mentioned Psalm chapter 68, verse 16. And there, the, the same root, Hamad, the same root is there in Hebrew, means desires to dwell. He desires to dwell. 
that amongst his people. Proverbs 12, 12. He is the desiring one. So you can see these are the derivations of the same the same root, M-H-M-A-D, and in the case of uh, what the, the, the one that we see in Song of Solomon. Now, Mahmud, something is desirable. These titles all come together as the Messiah, prim primarily as we get into away from B.C. up into A.D., and we're getting to St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose is uh, the father. Uh, he is a theologian, and he takes this reference, all these references, to the Messiah. As a Christian, he knows that the Messiah did come. He came in the form of Jesus Christ. So this Mahmud now is, the, is another derivation of the word Messiah, who he applies to Jesus Christ himself. The title then takes on a form of reference to Jesus from from the 380 or the 4th century on. By 523, then, a new inscription is introduced by the Jews, and they refer to this Muhammad as the Exilarchs. These are the ones who are in authority outside of Jerusalem, and as you have said over and over again, the Exilarchs tend to be where the Arab is. Arabic is spoken. They tend to be in what is today Iraq, in close to what is today Baghdad. So that makes sense that it also is in Arabic, along with Hebrew. That's why the Arabs knew about it, because they were there watching the Jews. They were there watching the Christians. Many of them were Jew Christians and Jews themselves, but they spoke Arabic. Therefore, they have known about this Mahmud. Yeah. Go ahead. Just uh, something that may, may be important there is that that inscription was in Sabaic as well, in in Yemen. So it's... Oh, no, it's that's uh, interesting. Explain that. Sabaic Arabic is what? And where is that found? Well, you kind of said it, but yeah. why is that yeah. distinction from any other Arabic? Well, it, the... The Sabaic script is completely different to the script that we're familiar with, you know, with the dots and lines and so forth. Now, of course, if, if Muhammad grew up in the Hejaz, as claimed, the Sabaic script would be the one that he should have been using because it's right. there for 12 centuries. And it would have been just easy just to use that. We would have no confusions because every letter gives you a particular sound. Um, now, the, the language down in the south is a form of Arabic that's very different as well from further north when we look at the the hey, just 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 so people don't confuse the sabaic arabic is the arabic from the south yes yeah from the sabine yeah, all... which, Sabi Sabi which is from the south yeah. yemen today yeah. with a different script from the the nabataean script that you find the nabataean is way up in what is today jordan so people are realizing jordan is a good thousand miles away so we're talking about Desert in between, but the desert would have used the Sabaic because that's where the influence was. The, so if there had been a Muhammad, he would be using this. However, interestingly, the Quran is written in that script, which is from the North Jordan. Yeah. I want to throw something else in the mix, something I haven't mentioned. You know, the elephant in the room is that Muslims will say, oh, well, we have proof that Muhammad was born in 570 because didn't Abraha go all the way to Mecca? And there's this elephant that, that goes there and there's a lovely fancy story. There's two problems with that. First is Procopius, who's the 6th century Byzantine historian. When he tells the account of that time, he mentions nothing about an elephant. We have an inscription which refers to an expedition. The problem is it's not in 570 AD. It's in 553 AD. And it is not in Mecca. It's way out. It's not even, there's no proof that it ever, that expedition ever reached any place near Mecca. So that's just major problems. And the funny thing about the Islamic tradition on this story is what is the name of the elephant? Mahmud. So they call the elephant the Messiah. It makes no sense. It's, it's almost farcical. So, you know, there's so much wrong with that story. So Jay, there's a, a paper by Daniel A. Beck and it basically analyzes Surah Al Fil, which is Surah one one hundred and five, and basically says that it's a clear allusion to um, the second and third book of Maccabees, and in that um, it talks about that it's really about the Seleucids and the uh, Ptolemaic uh, warriors attacking Jerusalem, um, and they use elephants. And then God basically defends the Jews, but it's not with birds dropping stones. Um, the, he a actually analyzes the word that's used in the Quran that's interpreted as stones dropped. And it's actually 
um, it's got the word uh, clay in it. And so he looks at the other instances where that the, the particular phrase that's translated as stones is used in the Quran. And it's always used in the context of where God is punishing people, such as in the story of Lot. And it's actually to do with uh, the, the, the clay that would come from a volcano, you know, like sulfur and brimstone, that kind of thing. It's got nothing to do with birds. In, in, in fact, he looks at the word that's used for birds and he's, he interprets it as, as actually meant to be angels. So it's the angels of God dropping these um, volcanic uh, clay tablets down on the people as punishment. That's really what's going on. So it's set not down in Mecca, but in Jerusalem. So it's got nothing to do with down there. They've completely misunderstood the, the illusions that are there. Um, I would go so far as to say that this is clearly a Jewish text uh, for a Jewish audience that would get the illusions. Because the Book of Maccabees is not a very well-known book for most Christians today, but it would have been a well-known book for, for Jews because it's part of Jewish literature. Great stuff. Right. We're going to end off this series here, but have you noticed what we've done? We've asked the question for Muslims, if you're going to prove that this man, the most important man uh, of, in your th religion, the man that has started, well, didn't start everything, but was the one that re was the greatest of all prophets, the seal of all prophets, like you keep telling us, uh, the one that received the greatest of all revelation, the seal of all revelation, to correct the previous revelations, as you keep telling us, uh, and that this all happened in a place called Mecca, the greatest of all cities, the earliest of all cities, the oldest of all cities, if this is you are saying this to us, then all we're going to do is ask one simple historical question, and that is, prove it from the 7th century. Prove it from before the 7th century. But don't go to the 8th, 9th, and 10th century, because by that time there is a place called Mecca, and there is a Quran that is starting to be put together. There is no Muhammad, but there is those two. But we don't want it from the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th. We want it from the 7th century. See, it's no good because all you've been saying to us for years and years and years, whenever we've criticized your historical character or your her your historical paradigm, I remember in my debate in 1995 with Dr. Jamal Badawi, that was his only comeback in 1995. So we're talking 30 years ago. At the end of that, and I gave 10 historical challenges, all from Patricia Corona, who had been with, I'd been with the week before in her office, getting these 10 challenges. His response to me is, Jay, you're only arguing from silence. And the absence of evidence does not prove the evidence of absence. And he was correct. In 1995, he was correct because I had no evidence. I had nothing. There was nothing. But see, now we're in 2024. 30 years later, almost 30 years later. And see, I have all kinds of evidence. Mel has all kinds of evidence. AJ Deuce, we're now coming with all kinds of evidence. We've already shown you that there is, there, there is lots of evidence for this word Muhammad. We can't find any evidence from or Mecca at all, at all. Which means if you Muslims are going to come up and prove that Mecca did exist, you're you're arguing from silence. You've got to prove the evidence. But in this case, we're no longer arguing from silence on Muhammad. We're now arguing from evidence, lots of evidence, lots of references to Muhammad, MHMD. Oh, my goodness. All the way back to 1400 BC, 1000 BC with the Hebrew Bible. It's in the Bible there today. You can still see it 11 times. And it's always pointing to the one who is the praised one, who is going to come, the precious one, altogether lovely, who Ambrose then picks up in the fourth century AD and applies it to Jesus Christ, the praised one, the altogether lovely, the Messiah. See, all Christians know that Jesus is the praised one. He is the Messiah. So by the time it gets to the uh, sixth century, where the Jews then take this and they're saying, this is the exilarch. These are, this is, these are the leaders of the Jews in the diaspora. These are the Messiah. These are the Messiah. And they even point to two Messiahs, Ben Joseph and Ben David. And they give them who they are. This is Hushiel. So can you then see, folks, by the 6th century, we're now in 523, that inscription is referring to this, this praised one, this Mahmud, who has just been killed four years earlier. Now we get to the 7th century, and you have both the Jews and the Christians vying for who is this Messiah. The Jews are still waiting for him, and they keep on applying it to one exilarch after the other. Each one keeps dying, so they have to keep applying to the next one, to the next one. 
the Christians know that he's already come and they know who he is. The Messiah is Jesus Christ. And th that title has been given to Jesus. That's why Mu'uwiya, who's a good Christian, he's a, a Trinitarian Christian. He not only has the cross on his coins, but he has the name Muhammad on the back to say, we've got the Messiah and his name is Jesus Christ. Now, can you see how the Arabs who remember everything we know about Islam today is a rejection of Christianity in the seventh century. Everything we know about Islam that we have found from the inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock, from the coins of Abdul Malik, it is an attack against Jesus, his divinity, attack against the Trinity, attack against his sonship. If you have attack and attack and attack, you're attacking that what is the very basis of Christianity. And the very basis of Christianity is that God did come to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. He took on that form. He humbled himself, became a man, even to the point of dying on the cross, but didn't stay dead, rose on the third day. That is a basis of everything we believe. That's the basis of everything Mel believes and everything I believe. As a Catholic and a, and a Protestant, we both believe that is at the foundation of everything we believe. Islam or this what became Islam is a rejection against that. It's a rejection against this Muhammad, this Messiah who came to die and then rise again. A rejection about the Messiah that is yet to come for the Jews. And it's saying to both Jews and to both Christians, we've got that Messiah. And he is not who you believe he is. He is not the Son of God. He is not the part of the Trinity. He is not God himself. He is actually a man name Muhammad. But once you do that, you've got to put a backstory to him. You've got to give him a history. You've got to place him in a place. So you can see all of this starts to be put together in the 9th and 10th and 11th century and redacted back onto the 7th century. They now have to put him in a place. They put him in a Mecca. Why in Mecca? Because you can't put him in Jerusalem because there's too much history already there. You've got to put him in a desert where no history exists. And then what do you do? You start borrowing all over the place all these structures from Jerusalem. You apply them to Mecca. And that's why they circumambulate seven times around clockwise around this thing called the Kaaba, which in both Hebrew and in Arabic means cube. And they're still doing that today around that cube seven times counterclockwise because the Jews did that. And then they run back and forth between these two mountains called Safa and Marwa, which is the Safa and Marwa, Mount Moriah and Mount Sophus there in Scopus, sorry, there in Jerusalem. They're just taking what was originally and putting it down to what is today for them Mecca. But by the time that happens, then they've got to give a story to this guy. They've got to have their prophet. And that, who is this Muhammad, this Messiah, the Muhammad that everybody's looking at? They're saying, we've got him. But now you've got to have a problem because you've got to create the story. You've got to, and that starts to be put together. We thought it was in the ninth century. And we've been saying this. That's I'm going to shut that down in just a few weeks. Once you have his, his story, then you've got to give his sayings, what he said, the Hadith. So now you start to got to create, create all these stories. And remember, even the Muslims, Muslims, you tell us this all the time. This guy named Al-Buhari was given 600,000 of these stories, and he whittles them down to 7,397. He throws out 98% and only retains the 2%. That is their narrative. They've got to create that narrative about this man saying, doing these things and saying these things. But that comes much, much later. So everything you Muslims are talking about for this guy, Muhammad, this guy, Muhammad, everything you're dependent on is not from the 7th century. As we're going to soon see, it's not even from the 9th and 10th century. It's from much, much later, redacted back. So now I stand here, and I, I, if uh, Jamal Badawi was standing in front of me, he's too old now to debate this, but I would ask Jamal Badawi, I would turn everything on its face. We are not arguing from silence, not anymore. Not after what Mel and AJ Dios has been producing. Have you seen, folks? Everything that we have done through these 17 episodes about this man, Muhammad, is not silence. We're looking at inscriptions. We're looking at all kinds of references. We're looking at maps. We're looking at uh, do documents that actually refer to this. And we're looking at it from the 7th century up into the 8th century. Actually, we're going back before that. We're going all the way back to 1000 BC, 1400 BC. We're going to the 4th century AD. We're going to 523 AD. That's the 6th century. Then we're going to coins in the 7th century. And we're showing almost in every case, evidence after evidence. We're using coins. We're using inscriptions. We're using documents. We're using maps. We're putting it on timelines. We are the ones who are not arguing from silence anymore. We have got the evidence. Where is your evidence, Muslims? You're arguing from silence. 
And anytime you try to say that we're arguing with science, we're going to flip it right back in his head and say, well, the, if you want to sit down, let's look at all the evidence we have. Where's your evidence? Until you can show us evidence for this man, Muhammad, living in a place called Mecca, receiving a book called the Quran in the seventh century, all your arguments are nothing but built on sand. That's how we're going to end this. That's how we're going to fulfill, fulfill this. But folks, can you see how this is this is going to be devastating for Muslims? We understand that. And you're going to have a reaction. Well, under, understandable. You've asked us to put it all together. We've done it today. We've put it all together for your sake. Because we, we know that this is so many different planks, so many things coming together. We wanted to put it in one segment so you could understand it. But isn't it great, Mel, that <laughs> after all these episodes, what we're saying is, if you just follow the evidence on the ground, if you just follow what they're saying, watch and see what they're saying. Look at the people that actually existed. Look and see this word. This word is well known. This name is well known. This title is well known. It's all over the place. But make sure you place the person or the main event or the character that this title is referring to in the right place at the right time, saying the right things. That's all we're asking. And we've done just that. You have the last words, Mel. What are you going to say? Well, Jay, I would say that, um, like, I'm really just a messenger. I'm just a mere warner. I know I'm, I'm someone who's basically bringing the research of others to the fore. People like Oleg, people like AJ Juice, Dr. Robert Kerr. And I'm also adding my own little bits and, and bringing things together that maybe they haven't noticed. Um, I think it's back in, uh, in the back in the court of uh, Muslims to respond to all of this evidence. They can't continue to ignore the evidence that's been presented. Um, I can't see Muslims being able to respond to to all of this evidence with the standard Islamic narrative. What's happened over the centuries, if they've, they've had leaky holes in their narrative all over the place, they try to plug the hole, but every time they try and plug a hole, they actually create a hole somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, you can't fake history it will always come out and if someone like me who's not the smartest person in the world can see these holes there's probably hundreds more people who haven't even started to look at this who are going to start focusing much more than previously um, because it's there to be found this is like the biggest treasure trove for people who are a little bit curious who want to ask questions what will happen when hundreds and thousands of muslims start looking at their own traditions start asking these questions that we're asking and they discover actually this is all just a big lie you know this has been a messianic movement that went off in a different tangent um you have a story essentially of exilarchs that were taught to be messiahs that morphed into an arabian prophet um that is the that is the story i think i'd like muslims to go away and think about as we end this series Listen, thanks so much, Mel. Uh, as we end here, I want to just say one thing. For many of you Muslims who are, are probably angered by what the conclusions we're coming to in this segment, that's understandable. But please don't get angry. You don't need to. Because, listen, there is someone else who has passed all of these tests, who has had every one of these, these types of questions thrown at him. His name is Jesus Christ. He also was questioned whether or not he existed. That was in the 1800s. Questioned whether or not he lived in Jerusalem, was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth. Questioned whether he died on the cross and rose again. These are questions that are at the very root of our faith. If there was not a Jesus who died and rose again in Jerusalem, if those three things did not exist, we're all damned. And that's why we had to find the answer. Rather than get angry, we didn't get angry in the last hundred years. We have found reference after reference, evidence after evidence in the first century and in the second century for this person of Jesus Christ. The fact that he was born in Bethlehem, the fact that he did grow up in Nazareth, the fact that he did die in Jerusalem and rose again on the third day and then rose up 50 days later to be to be home, go home uh, with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so important that we are able to argue from evidence for our Lord Jesus Christ. Muslims, don't give up. You probably cannot find any evidence for Muhammad in the 7th century receiving a Quran in a place called Mecca. I don't think you're going to be able to find that. We've been asking this now for a good, well, since 1995, so a good 30 years, and we still haven't found any Muslim that can really debate this, these, those three issues. So listen, please don't give up. Just come on home. Come on home to the, what, the person who has a historical record, who we can 
proof existed, who we know where he was born. We know where he grew up. We know where he died, and we know where he rose again. And because he did that, all of us, all of us know where we're going on the other side of death. We'd love to bring you home. Come on home to Jesus Christ. He does fulfill the historical record, the historical test. Muhammad does it. It's pretty clear now that he is not the Muhammad you're looking for. He's not the Muhammad of history. He's nothing more than the Muhammad of faith. Our Jesus is both the, the Jesus of history and the Jesus of faith. We can support him. And we don't just do that willy-nilly. We do that so that you can support him, so that you can come home to him. Come on home to Jesus Christ. We'd love to have you as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Mel and Jay. Over and out.